Thank you. Um, I'd just also like to thank Joe Mulholland for making the decision to have mental health discussed um, at the McGill School. I was diagnosed as suffering from anxiety-related depression in 1992, just after my father's death. But in truth, I think I suffered with this condition for many years before the diagnosis. In the years before 1992, I cried almost every day. I was entirely without hope, and I felt I was a weak person who could just pull myself together. I felt wrong, that my very being was wrong, that being me was upsetting the people I cared for, my parents. I was in a relationship with a separated, ergo in the times that were in it, still married man. I was an actress, very much in the public eye, drawing attention to myself. I had changed my religion to Buddhism, which in turn told me that if I was still unhappy, I must be doing it wrong. I felt cursed. I felt like a pollutant. When the, diagnose, when the diagnosis was given, I felt huge relief. At least now, there was a reason for the way I felt, and there was help. The psychiatrist suggested medication. I was reluctant to take it at first, but I so longed to feel better, I took it, and within three weeks, it kicked in. It was so extraordinary to feel ordinary again, to enjoy normal things again, feel free of the constant negativity and sadness. And for a year, I was happy to coast. It was like a holiday from myself. Then I began to feel guilty for feeling good on medication. Surely I could feel better without it. So I went back to talking therapy and tried to come off the meds. It didn't work. In the next few years, I worked on Glen Row, and after that, one theatre tour after another for ten years, and always with my faithful black dog at my side. Skip forward to now in this room. I'll admit, I was flattered to be asked to be part of this august gathering. Every mover and shaker in the country will be here at some time or another. I felt excited by the prospect of speaking here, because when it comes to mental illness, I have a lot to say. But about a month ago, I wanted to bail. I didn't want to make this talk. Why? The word hope. I couldn't cope with the word hope. For many years now, I have vowed to be honest, to speak as I find. I don't want to indulge in a form of psychological airbrushing. So how could I be honest about hope? How could I give hope when I had none? I have this condition for most of my adult life. I've tried every therapy going, and it still persists. So how can I have hope? And yet... After thinking long and hard, here I am. Have I embraced hope? Not really. Not with regards to my condition. So, what am I going to say today? How can I be honest about having no hope and not sound gloomy? Because loss of hope does not mean gloom. If you ask a, a depressive to make a speech, you're going to have a bit of gloom. <laughs> Hopelessness aside, I have learned a lot about the world through my illness. Let me share with you what I have learned, and you may be surprised. The only thing to really know is that if you are not depressed and anxious in the world we have created, then you really are crazy. Depression is a very logical reaction to the chaos we experience. In the be belief that we are superior to the rest of nature, we have allowed technology to override our humanity. Society is still largely patriarchal. The demise of religion has led to a loss of moral compass. compass. Hubris is still worshipped and intellectuals just talk the talk. 
We love information because it is fast, and we don't have the patience for wisdom because it is too slow. I don't think society has ever really got the point. Life is not human-centered. We have a part to play in the great scheme of things, but we are not the only story. And if there is to be hope, we must realise this before it's too late because we are destroying our world and the people in it. Now is the time for the walking wounded to be heard. Now is the time to let suffering be a teacher and not something to be cured. In fact, let me turn the thing on its head and say people who suffer with me mental health issues have a really important lesson to teach if only the movers and shakers would listen. What would we say? if only we were listened to. We would say that we are all human, and to be fully human, we have to embrace our vulnerability because it goes right through us, and it can't be cured. It is true, and this is true, for the powerful, as much as for the weak. Everything we say and do has an effect on ourselves and others. So for heaven's sake, can't we collectively cop ourselves on? Everything we see, and even what we don't see, started as an idea. Cars, buildings, technology, the arts. Look around this room. Tables, chairs, light bulbs, pens, paper, the clothes we wear, buttons, zips. Practically everything we encounter in our daily lives, apart from the miracle of nature, stems from a thought. And where do thoughts originate? The mind. That's where. So isn't it a bit upside down to try to fix the economy before fixing the minds that had the ideas that in turn created the mess? Instead of trying to fix society, let's fix the minds that had ideas such as we can live with equality, lack of education, and hatred of people because they are different. Let's fix the minds that think it's okay to commoditize themselves for fame. <laughs> Marketing shiny, happy, ever after lives and beautiful bodies when there really is no such thing as certainty and bodies change for all manner of reasons, good and bad. Let us change the minds of the people who feed off those fragile fame monkeys. Let's fix the minds of those who think it's okay to spend millions on dubious works of art while people starve. Let's fix the minds of those that think they can speak for God. God says you can't do this. God says you can't do that. You can't be gay. You can't have sex without marriage. God is white. God is black. God said he gave us nature to dominate. God says women shouldn't be free. God says men can kill. What a load of cobblers. As a Buddhist, I can't really speak for God, but I'd venture to say he's kind of fed up. Each form of mental distress is different, so I can't say how it is even for another depressive. But let me tell you how I feel when I am under the weather in this modern world. Everything is too fast. Everyone has an opinion about everything, and it's usually badly thought out, negative nonsense. Everyone wants to star in their own show. I've done that, and it's not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> Nobody sees the soul of a person. Newspapers, magazines, and entertainment media pump out vicious, hurtful stories about people. Mediocrity is rewarded. There is no elegance, no grace, no gentleness, no tenderness, in fact, looking at the world from the Victor Meldrew perspective of depression, it seems as though society is psychically cannibalizing itself. It feels unsafe to read or hear nasty, snide comments when you are depressed, because even though the comments aren't about you, it feels like being in a jungle watching another, <coughs> another animal being mauled. <coughs> you feel the whole jungle is unsafe. You want to run, but where to? Because there is only the jungle. To think about mental illness in terms of poor things, let's try and help them, is to miss the nugget of gold encased in the problem. 
Help us, yes, but also question yourselves. Ask yourself every day, do I do something to create this dangerous jungle? Do I see the humanity in my employees, my co-workers, my students, my readers, my audience, my congregation? Because mental health is not just the responsibilities of workers in the field, it's the responsibility of all of us. We are not islands in life. We are a vast ocean of connectivity. Our thoughts, words and actions affect our world and the people in it in ways that we cannot see. So even if one person in this room thinks, okay, I will take up this responsibility, even if I am the only person here to do it, then there is hope, that bloody word. So how do you do it? Take responsibility. It's so simple, but it's not easy. Just be kinder, drop the judgment, cut people some slack, Love your planet, and if you can't love your neighbours, leave them alone. <laughs> and do this consistently for the rest of your life. Be prepared to fail, because everyone does, and let's face it, there are some really irritating people out there. I'm so glad I'm not one of them. <laughs> and every time we fail, we start again. And we forgive ourselves for failing. Because if we don't have compassion and forgive ourselves in this process, there is no point in it. So back to hope. Is there hope? You bet there is. The fact that an erstwhile self-hating, self-censoring woman can stand here and say the things I've just said means there's hope. And no, honestly, I have no hope with regards to my condition. But let me share my beliefs about my life. I believe the yet best is yet to come for me. I can't control what happens to me, it's true. But I now know it's the nature of life to be good, bad, delightful, horrific, and everything in between. And I know my fragility as a human being. And I know that to be fragile is no shame. I know that life is not something that is there to be easy or to satisfy my every want or need. I know life always deserves a capital letter because it is greater than me. It's mysterious. It's immeasurable. And finally, I know I am grateful. So grateful to be alive. In joy, <clears throat> in pain, in hope, in my humanity. Thank you.